Hey folks, Dr. Mike here for the Making Progress channel. Today's topic, video number 20, is how to have difficult conversations in important relationships. And it is in the, I think, new category for us. I've had videos uh, listed in this for a long time, relationships and dating. I find myself to be something like an anti-expert in dating. I'll definitely tell you it doesn't work. And maybe a few things that I got lucky with a few times back in college or something when I used to date. In any case, here's what we're going to talk about today. First, why good communication is important. Because you can always just say some stuff and be like, I don't care if this makes sense. Why difficult conversations are sometimes needed. And this is something that's tough for me because I'm such a social person and I like to be really seamless and fluid and I don't take offense very easily. So when I'm in conversations that are difficult, I have a tendency to be like, why can't we just do this? Sometimes conversations are going to be tough and you have to understand that before preparing for them. How not to have difficult conversations, basically chatting about things with you guys that are like things we all do sometimes in tough conversations that are not productive. How to have difficult conversations. Finally, as you guys are used to this, finally get to the actual recommendations 40 minutes into the video. Time courses of issue resolution. When you have a difficult conversation, how long is it going to take to resolve the issue? Is it just going to get crushed out right there and then? Maybe. Is it going to be something that never gets crushed out? Maybe. And everything in between. And then the incremental approach to getting better at conversations, which is to say none of us are perfect. And what I'm going to give you guys as far as tips of things not to do and to do, I don't get this right stuff perfectly. And I'm essentially at like beyond Einstein level of IQ. Like Einstein was good, but you're boy, I know things. So if I can't be perfect, how do I expect you fucking mortals to be perfect? Um, I zoned out for 30 seconds. What did I just say? I don't even remember my last thought. In any case, let's get to it. Why good communication is important. Because every important communication that you have is almost certainly going to be, short of yelling for a police officer or help while you're getting assaulted, in the context of a relationship that you have. And you need relationships for your own good. Many, hopefully most, Maybe almost all the relationships you are currently in are for your own good in a very selfish way. Because you want these relationships to be a certain way that's better for you than not better for you, better than worse, just from a purely selfish perspective, you're going to want to get good at communicating. Some examples. You need a job. So knowing how to communicate with people beneath you in the corporate hierarchy at the same level and ooh, above you, like your boss, that's important. You need your kids to do well if you have kids. You want them to do well approximately right now and later in the future in their lives. How you talk to them might have a role in steering them to do better or worse on certain even, let's say, very small margins, but nonetheless on the margin. Because you – maybe you have a partner in life uh, – uh, husband, wife, girlfriend, boyfriend, G, J, Jem, that kind of shit. And uh, you want them to do well because you love them or like them at least or tolerate them or put up with them. And how you talk to them might steer them to do better or worse in that regard. Also because you have needs from your partner and needs from all of your other relationships. And if you communicate your needs uh, being met in a way that they could be met better? Well, if you communicate that well, maybe your needs will be met better than worse. And of course, all this doesn't just apply to your boss and your kids and your wife, but it applies to all of the other important relationships you have, um, friends, family, the, uh, the mailman, the paper boy, the person that delivers the milk. No, wait, no, wait, that's the 1950s. Scott, the video guy, Whatever happened to the milk delivery person, what is the downfall of Western civilization that that is no longer a job? Yeah, it's weird. Like I get Fairlife delivered like every day. Awesome. Yeah, a Fairlife delivery. Fairlife people, get on that. I want milk delivery and I want the guy to wear the hat and I want it to be okay for me to have sexual relations with the milk person with nothing the matter at all with any of that, according to him, 
her, whatever. I don't care. I just need sex. And uh, and myself and my own family, as it was in the 50s. Yeah, the milkman's child, right? 100%. I think maybe half of the population is actually progeny of the milkman. And that's how it should be. In any case, why are difficult conversations tough? We know why they're needed because you want to help all of those relationships that we just talked about. Why are they tough? How how are they tough? First, in difficult conversations, sometimes you're pissed and that makes you short-sighted and curt, if not worse things. When you're pissed, it's hard to express yourself and it's hard to listen. The other person can be pissed and that makes them closed off to any kind of communication in many cases, or if they do let you in, they're very defensive when they let you in. That makes it real tough. Another thing that can make these conversations difficult is you may actually disagree on really core things and you've just been kind of snaking your way around them and hinting at them for a while, and they're painful to broach. Uh, You know, there could be something your significant other is doing that you're like just straight up not cool with. Like I was watching um, NBA Wives or Basketball Wives or something like that with my wife. It's a stupid ass reality show. And, uh, you know, a lot of ladies on there, they're like, hey, like basketball player husband, I'm not cool with you hitting up groupies on the road. And if that was me, I'd be like, bitch, are you you serious? You You married a basketball player. The groupies are included. It's like being pissed that they gave you a biscuit with your KFC. I paid good money for that shit. Actually, I didn't pay anything at all. It just comes with a meal is what I'm trying to say. But in any case, there could be some stuff in relationships where it's like, no, actually not cool with it. We'd love to have a world in which we could just talk through anything. But one of the reasons conversations could be so difficult is that some stuff you don't want to talk about because that will bring you and your uh, partner or your friend or your boss to an impasse. And that's, that's a big deal. And if you have the conversation, and people know this, which is why conversations can sometimes be difficult, reason number four is that what might come to pass when you actually communicate is maybe not fun. And that's putting it very mildly. Sometimes someone has to admit guilt. Like, yep, this is my fault. People don't like to do that. That's why it's hard. The relationship also may no longer be viable afterwards. Uh, you are not as uh, you are not sufficiently aligned to continue the relationship either on the terms that you understood it, on the terms that existed, or on any terms whatsoever. It's like, yes, I have been dating Sally behind your back, your best friend this whole time. And she's like, no. Wait, Sally? With the curly hair Sally or the straight hair Sally? Curly hair. She's like, oh, no, that's cool. Yeah, we're in a threesome anyway. You're like, hey. Like, what about straight hair Sally? You're like, that's it. We're, We're done. How dare you? The two Sallys in my life. People are scared of being labeled as guilty, having to admit it. They're scared of relationships that they found at least marginally valuable disappearing in front of them or changing for the worse uh, in the long term. And so chatting about deep stuff, difficult stuff, can be really, really tough for all these reasons. Like I said in the intro, I'm an individual that on my sort of more ignorant days, pretend slash would love for every conversation to be able to be super easy. But a lot of conversations can be really tough. Even if one of the people is like, I'm here for all the stuff, the other person might not be. And you might be the person that says, I'm here for it all. And then the person you're talking to is like, what about X, Y, Z? And you're like, whoa, I'm not here for that. Holy cow, how dare you? And then it's a tough conversation. So you have to come in with some tools, tools that allow you to have difficult conversations. We'll get to those tools in just a bit. But first, for five easy payments of 10 dollars how to talk to people by Dr. Mike. Well, I just go on random college campuses to talk to regular people. That'd be fun. Scott, the video guy, you want to, Dr. Mike hits the University of Michigan Ann Arbor campus on like rush week. Ooh, that would be saucy. I would love to interview people who are talking to frats and sororities about like, why are you joining? And then be like, do you realize you're paying for your friends? I would be looking for that one in a thousand person that would be like, you know, aren't we all paying for friends in a certain sense? I'd be like, let me shake your hand. You're really galaxy braining the shit. All right. So, yes, we will get to how to have conversations better. But first, on our worst days at least, 
many, if not most of us, come to difficult conversations with the same kind of toolkit that like a first grade school teacher with her pencils and pens and markers would come to like a fight with a bear. The wrong shit. Here are how many? Seven ways to not have a conversation. Now, here's what I mean. This isn't a one or zero. This isn't 100% of the time you shouldn't do this. But for almost all of these seven ways not to have a conversation, what I will tell you guys, this is my truthful opinion. It strains my imagination to come up with a representative class of important conversations you care about in which you would actually do these things. What are they? First, sarcasm. Now, funny for me to be shitting on sarcasm, it's hilarious. If you don't have a sarcastic sense of humor, there's a very good chance we'll never be friends. And it doesn't mean I hate you. I love you and wish you the best. I just don't chill with people that don't have fucked up senses of humor. If you guys knew what Scott the Video Guy and I talked about off camera, first of all, you will never hear that shit because it will get canceled instantly. Think of the worst shit you ever joked about. Multiply that by 10. And then put that into a situation in which the Pope and Mother Teresa would pass out. I would say what they were doing beforehand in order to pass out, but that would get me canceled. That's my sense of humor. But the thing is, in a very serious conversation, nobody's joking. And mean sarcasm, like when someone chews someone out and gets saucy, it's funny if you're watching a movie, but not if you're doing it to someone and sure shit if it's not being done to you. Sarcasm in a serious conversation creates more division and less understanding, which is the opposite of what you're there to do. And a lot of times we get into these things almost naturally, humans tend to do this, is what I call performative sarcasm, where if you guys have ever seen your parents fight when you were little, my parents do this shit all the fucking time, is arguably still do it sometimes, is people will talk to each other as if there's a crowd watching, even though it's just you and you're four years old and you're thinking, how the fuck did I get born into this, JK? But I know people even do this. I've been one-on-one -on -one with people and they do this. I've done this to people one-on-one. -on -one. There was nobody watching. You still do this performative sarcasm like, oh, okay, you're going to tell me that I parked the car in the wrong spot? Oh, wow. And it's like, yeah, that feels cool to say. And if there was a camera and you were on Seinfeld, it'd be like, oh, this is juice. But it's just between the two of you. And that doesn't help anyone because sarcasm is not helpful. It's just funny. If you're disarming a bomb and someone needs you exact instructions as to how to do it, the time for sarcasm has come to a fucking end. And in a certain sense, difficult conversations can be approached, maybe not with the sort of tenacity and precision of disarming a bomb, but in some cases, some of the seriousness of it. So yeah, I love sarcasm. And as a joke, it's all good. It's all jokes. Jokes are jokes. Jokes are funny. Uh, when it's not time to joke anymore, the sarcasm you can leave behind. Now, as soon as the tough conversation is over, I just love to layer it in a ton. But, you know, that's just because I have like a sarcasm vomit machine that just builds up and at some point it needs to come out. Not during the important conversations. Number two thing you don't want to do is guilt tripping. There are two reasons why guilt tripping is a bad idea. One, you love that person and or they're very important to you. Why do you want to put guilt on them? Guilt is a terrible thing to walk around with. And I, I, I watch people guilt trip their significant others, and I just don't understand it. You, you said you would die for this person. You said, till death do us part or whatever ring, and I won't fuck hoes anymore. And now you're making their life miserable? Oh, all for their eventual good, I'm sure. But the second point is, it's just not an effective way to communicate. And you can sort of guilt trip young children to do things, and maybe that's a part of being a child and growing up. But because you should have some fucking deep shame about some bad shit you did. But a lot of times when you're having conversations with people, they didn't do something like it was dishonorable. It, there's just a disagreement there and nuance and perspective. And so guilt isn't something you shoot off first with. And it really, a decent person will have guilt anyway when they realize what's going on. If you're saying, well, you should feel guilty about this, it's probably uh, you're at an impasse anyway. In addition to that, if you try to guilt trip someone, that's a really good way of enhancing their recalcitrance, which means like they're just like, you know what? Fuck you. No. They just stop like a tick. They just bury down and they're just done. It's just ineffective. And I'll add to this nagging. 
If you nag someone to try to change them or to get something done, you're just elevating the degree to which they find you annoying and hate you. Nagging is almost everywhere a bad idea, and the only reason you're doing it is because you're frustrated. You didn't think through and say, mm, from a psychological engineering perspective, if I nagged this person to be better, they would get better and they would love it. It would be great. No one's ever done that because that logic doesn't hold. We only ever nag people because we're frustrated and it just comes out. But like most things that come out in times when you're frustrated, they're probably not the right answer for how to effectively communicate with someone. So guilt tripping, nagging, 90% of the shit my parents talked to me about when I was a kid is off the table. Crazy, I know. Number three, ridicule does not accomplish the communicating. You're just being a hater. And it is very likely to create derision and backlash. Like, you're going to ridicule me? I want a shot at the title again. Now we're just in a flame war and nothing is being accomplished. This is, it's, it's very lame to do in private because it's deeply painful, it is even lamer to do in public. If you ridicule your significant other, like in a grocery line, and if my wife are standing next to the two of you, we do like the big emoji look around eyes, and we just kind of like, holy shit, is this really happening? Because you shouldn't be doing that. That is not how adults behave, simply because of two things. One, it's unkind. And two, it is very, very ineffective. It's just bullying. And slow clap if that makes you feel better. But again, if you are in a relationship with someone, that means in some greatly important sense, they're on the same team as you. You do not ridicule people on your own team. Ridicule is safe for, uh, I don't know, people you hate or something. Rhetorical ridicule about characters on TV that you'll never meet. That's totally cool. Real life. If you want to make a change and communicate better, if you want to grow closer instead of farther apart, ridicule, not very good. And you would think this is like, duh, but like husbands and wives ridicule each other. And they're like, oh, how'd this divorce end up happening? What? You were pushing the person away for a long time. That's what you were doing. But I love them. Uh, evidence being exactly, completely the opposite. Number four, thing you shouldn't do. This one's a doozy. This might hit some of you guys a little close to home. Just spilling the beans. Just saying shit like boom, 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 really direct. No couching, no compliment sandwich, just raw shit. Just like, this is what I think. This is what I think you're doing wrong and you need to change it. Now, that all might be true. And it very probably is true. Everything you said is at least true for how you feel and may very well be true about the global situation at hand. Like, yes, they should stop doing the thing they're doing. It was a bad idea the first time they did it. And it, you shouldn't have had to talk to them this long about it. But just spilling the beans is cool and all. It's not super effective because it throws people off and they shut down to being as open to something as if you were to just be a little bit more ginger about it. That gingerness isn't because you're a nice person. You should be a nice person anyway. And people that are real talkers aren't unkind people. They're just not as effective at communication as someone who potentially is a bit more on ramping someone to be ready to hear the truth. And this works in every kind of situation. You come up to someone randomly on the street because you got your GPS shit and you're looking for the Empire State Building and there's all these other tall buildings. And you know, like when you're in the city, the GPS doesn't fucking work anyway. If you come up to someone and say, where's the Empire State Building? they will be like, all right, what? Who the fuck are you? Get out of my face. But you just ask them a straightforward question. It wasn't even offensive. They're just like really direct. In New York, that might fly because everyone's like that. But New Yorkers will be like, hey, fuck out of my face. Whoa. What you might want to do instead is, excuse me, I don't mean to bother you. Is it okay if I ask you where I'm kind of lost? Is there like Empire State? Is that, and do you know where that is? I'm like, yeah, it's down the block, whatever. Whoa. And they walk off because they're New Yorkers. But that whole bullshit you did, well, excuse me, I don't mean to blah, blah, blah. Technically, it's all filler. But it's filler designed as an entry vehicle to the human mind. And if you're just ultra direct, a lot of humans will be like, Duh, I'm not into this. I don't know what this is. I'm not into it. And a lot of people pride themselves on it. I used to back when I was in college, I'm just really direct. Like, yeah, but another way to think of that is like you're kind of an incel pseudo autist, like Redditor, like speaking truth to power. And you 
can do better because you care, right? You do care because these are important relationships to you. Look, if you want to be direct and a fucking dick to people at the supermarket who are bagging your groceries, hey, word up. I don't even go to the grocery store. My butlers do. And I tell them to be mean to people because I'm rich and I want that rich people to be known as being mean. This is just right. It's just American. But in, in relationships I care about, I care about that person and I want them to have a good time for communication's sake and just not to piss them off and make them feel less than sake. So the whole like bluntness thing, at the end of the day, the best way to contextualize bluntness is I want to get to the problem to solve it. Hey, listen, everyone should be blunt. We should all want to solve problems. But blunt and rude is a very fine line between them. Try not to cross that line. Next. Shifting responsibility. Classic. You'll get this on the internet all the time. You need to just do the work of learning this yourself. It's not my job to teach you. Like you'll get this in debates where people are like, I don't understand why XYZ issue is a thing that this group cares about. And like you educate yourself. Like what do you think, social justice warrior Karen? But I have a question for you, Karen. Does that ever work? Notice I'm being sarcastic. I'm not trying to have a very civil conversation with Karen. I'm being sarcastic because there is no Karen. There's just a camera in front of me, not a real person, and it's comedic intent. But honestly, like, I don't think that ever worked. I don't think that's ever worked once. Someone's like, well, I just don't understand why some racial groups are upset about the way policy is. I think we ended racism 30 years ago, right? Uh, you know, potentially a comment with a lot of validity, but also a bit obtuse. And like, well, it's not my job to teach you how systemic racism works. Educate yourself. Like, do you think it's, it's ever been one instance where someone read that response from Karen and was like, oh, yeah, good point. I'll go educate myself. No, fuck no, dude. Maybe one in a thousand, 999 a thousand is like, fuck you, bitch. Nah, nah, nah. Of course. So if you want to have a meaningful communicative interaction with someone, you are 100% assuming the burden that you are willing to be a throughput vessel, that you are willing to do the work, that you are willing to help them along. Because if you want to respond to someone on Instagram and say, well, you just need to educate yourself, you might as well just save it. Because if you can say something like that, that also says you don't give a shit, which means it's not an important conversation for you to be having, which means you could just go scroll away on Instagram and look at titties or whatever people look at on the gram. Don't even bother saying anything because if you want to make positive change in this world by reaching out to another human soul and be like, hey, I totally understand what you think about systemic racism, but there's kind of some nuance here. Let me tell you about it versus like you need to go educate yourself. Like that is a totally valueless statement. So don't shift the responsibility onto that person. When you enter a communication, you accept the responsibility, at least in part, at least your part. And your part is as much as you can possibly do. Because if it was my responsibility 100% to talk to other people and convince them of things, but I had an understanding that I was going to be successful every time, I talk to everyone in the world. That's the last thing I do in my entire life is talk to every person to try to convince them of being better at whatever the fuck I thought they were wrong at. I want the responsibility and so do you because you want to change the situation in that relationship. You want to make things better. If you don't want to accept the responsibility for that, fuck off. Like it's like you're, you're a soldier shooting people in wartime or whatever and you're like, you know, you miss a guy and your clip runs out and you clip the clip and you duck behind the trench. You're like, man, it's not my responsibility to kill these guys. It's the tank's job. But what, the, what the fuck? That's like mutiny. <laughs> Shut up and shoot people. You're in this thing, right? You committed to the thing. And in a certain sense, on a very small scale, relationships are sometimes analogy-wise, they're like war. You need to click your gun in and fucking raise it up because it's on you. And if it's not on you, what are you talking to people for? Next, compliment sandwiches are great. And we'll get to how to use them in just a bit. But there is too much compliment sandwiching. Remember, the, the, the analogy here is the meat is the real thing you want to talk about. And the bread is the filler that like makes it palatable. But hopefully your sandwiches, meat's not that terrible that you need bread to wash it down. You know what I'm saying? Point number six here on what not to do is what I call the bread heavy compliment sandwich. It's like two French bread pieces and then one thin strip of ham in between them. And someone eats it and they're like, what did you just eat? They're like, French bread. They're like, but what else? They're like, two pieces of it. Like, but there was ham in there. They were like, was it? I couldn't taste it. What do I mean by this? Some people 
flip the just spilling the beans and being direct thing so far on its head, they are so not interested or so scared of confrontation that they'll couch and nuance and layer and compliment sandwich the point so much, it's actually difficult to find out what the hell the point even is. So another situation is they'll try to get the person to come to the point with their own reasoning. You're like, well, okay, so we've been having some issues recently. And the person's like, okay, like what? I'm like, well, do you, can you think back to like the picnic we had? Like, mm-hmm. So there was like a thing you said that really, I think just like, and it was totally great thing. I totally see how you said it, but like, do you see what I'm saying? They're like, no, motherfucker, just tell me what's going on. Now, obviously, that doesn't mean you tilt and go, you're the reason my life sucks. It's just straight up being brash. There's a middle road there, folks. So you don't want to be too harsh, too blunt, too spilling the beans. And you also don't want to take the thing you're really trying to say and layer so much BS with it that the person's like, okay, so everything's good? You're like, no, it's not what I meant. But I can't say what I really meant because I'm a wuss. So there, it does take some balls to have a tough conversation, but it's not just balls. There's got to be nuance. So it's a bit of a middle road there. Lastly, point number seven. In deciding whether or not to have difficult conversations and even in the sub points within them, try not to put anything on someone that's actually on you. So for example, If there's something about someone that annoys you, that's your fucking problem. That's not necessarily their problem or potentially not their problem at all. If you really can't deal with it and you really think they're in the wrong and you really think that it's something they can change and would want to change if you talk to them about it, only then is it cool to say something. Like if you're hanging out with all your friends and, you know, the one of the acquaintances, Marty, she just has a really annoying laugh. Well, what the fuck are you going to say about that? Can you not laugh like that, bitch? Are you nuts? I don't choose how I laugh. It's just we all genetically laugh some fucking way. So fuck off and die. Like that's a fine response to that as far as I'm concerned. If you, there are some people that if you empower them with the tools of good communication, they turn into like psychotherapists to everyone and they just try to change everyone around them as much as possible to be the perfect versions for them. But the reality is that's an insanely uphill and presumptuous as shit battle. You're better off changing yourself or even better, becoming at peace with the reality that people are different and some people, no, no. All people are not perfect and that there's some of stuff that people just, they do that you don't like. And most of the time your job is to swallow it, grow up and realize, hey, like my expectation of perfection is a mentally ill person approach to the world. How this person is acting is fundamentally totally cool, but they do some weird stuff. I'm just, anytime they do the weird stuff, I'm going to be like, hey, you know, it's just weird stuff. No big deal. And I don't go on that other side of like, oh. It's your imperfections that make you who you are, which is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. You know, like, no, no, we all want to be as perfect as possible. That's obvious and should never be repeated. But at the same time, you know, you should be totally cool with people's imperfections unless you have a really easy way to solve them. And if you're always trying to solve everyone's imperfections, you're annoying and nobody likes you anymore. So most of the time, You should just be a person that's cool with shit. You don't have to have a come to Jesus talk with everyone every six months. I know a few people like that. I won't say who they are. Uh, They, every few months, it's like something fundamental is wrong with someone in their life. And uh, if you're a person, I've I've actually heard other people say something similar to like, well, I'm not a drama. uh, You guys have probably heard this too. I'm not a a drama prone person. Drama just follows me around. Like mm -hmm. drama, some karmic force that like, what are you talking? Of course it's you. You're the common denominator. (laughs) Like I know guys that get into a lot of street fights and they're like, I don't know what it is, man. It's not like I'm trying to start. I'm like, (laughs) I've been to like a few street fights is really big mistakes on my behalf. Uh, I knew that I was a contributor to that. I could have reacted in 10 different ways that would have not led to the fight. I just chose violence that day. It was always dumb and it was always on me. And if you get in a lot of street fights, it's on you, bro. So a lot of times 
most times you shouldn't be having these difficult conversations because they're not needed. You just need to be okay with people being different. On the situations in which you do have to have them, then yes, but point number seven here still stands. The last point on things not to do is just to start labeling everything as a, a, a psychotherapy session. I'm going to try to change everyone in my life. You're going to have a bad time. Most human traits are intractable. They don't change much or at all, or they change a little and they come back to baseline. So learning to live with people's differences is like number one rule. Number two is if you do want to parse differences, communicate effectively. What does effectively mean? We know what effectively doesn't mean. Let's get to what is effective communication. It's a 12-step process. Scott, the video guy, isn't it? What's it? 12 is 12 steps. Is that like a alcohol drug rehab thing? It is, is what? I think it's Alcoholics Anonymous. You've been in a group called Alcoholics, like Alcoholics Open and Facebook and here's my profile. I'm not anonymous at all, right? I worry about you. But you're Irish, so it's normal, right? Uh, yep, yeah, fuck it. <laughs> well, I'm Russian, so I wouldn't know anything about that. In any case, actually, here we go. Here we go. Tips on how to have difficult conversations. First, choose the right time and place. There are a couple of helpful ideas here. First of all, when it bubbles up in you that it's time to have this talk, that's probably not the right time to do it. Because if you cool the fuck down and really strategically architect your approach, you're going to do better. The worst arguments happen when people just can't take it anymore. And they usually don't make a whole lot of sense. It's just vitriol and the other person gets vitriolic back and it's just bad forever. Another thing, and we talked about this a little earlier, have some fucking propriety and don't have nasty conversations in a car with other people, in an elevator with other people, in, uh, you know, grocery stores, in the office with the wrong people around. You got to choose your time and place. Got to choose your time and place. Next, there is a sequence of how I think it's wise to talk to people. I'm going to give you every part of the sequence now from now on is the sequence, the whole thing. It's 11 step sequence, basically. You don't always have to do every part in sequence. You can also do every single part and the whole doing this, I'm going to talk about this for quite some time of every single part and what it means and why and how, and give some examples. That doesn't mean your prelude to every conversation to like, hey, can you wash the dishes more often needs to be like a 30 minute preamble. But what it does mean is that depending on the depth of conversation you want to have, depending on the, how much blowback you think there could be from a misunderstanding, you can do layer in more of these or fewer than these as you see fit. But just understand these are all tools to be deployed roughly in sequence. So here we go. First, tell the person potentially, these are all potentially, that you care about them and that you really like slash love them and all that stuff, do it first so that you don't spill the beans on them first. And then when they're crying, you're like, by the, by the way, I've, I love, I just want you to know I love you. I, everything I said was with love. It, it just does not come off the same if it's a rear guard like, oh yeah, I shouldn't have just said that. So if you think it's some real shit coming down the pipe and they might react not so well to it, it's sometimes a good idea to affirm your commitment and your love and all that stuff. And you can also say to some extent, and you can say this after as well, I'll get to that in a bit, there's a nuanced way to do this that doesn't sound like a threat. You may want to say in some gentle way that the reason you are talking to them about this is evidence of the fact, is precisely because of the fact that you like them a lot. Because people in your life you don't give a shit about, you're usually not having come to Jesus talks with them. Like if you have a girl you dated for two weeks and she's just got some nasty habits you're not into, man, you're not going to talk to her about shit. You're going to be like, hey, I'm busy for the rest of my life. Delete my number. <laughs> Bye. If you choose to talk to someone, you can tell them in a gentle way, like, hey, like, listen, I'm really into you. And I want to talk to you about this because I'm really into you. That carries some weight. Next, again, potentially, admit your imperfections and that you're wrong about shit all the time. 
because it's very easy for them to get into the mind frame of, oh, oh, I'm a child. This is my teacher. I'm the mistake. They're the fixer. I'm broken here. You, hey, listen, Buddha. Listen, Moses. Listen, Jesus H. Christ. You tell me how to live my life. You, the godhood person who never gets anything wrong. Now, they might not respond that nasty, but you can do some amount of reducing that probability by just straight up admitting, dude, I fuck up all the time. I really do. Next segue to this, which is the next point, consider saying something like, you could be wrong and misunderstanding the issue. Like, dude, I'm terrible about this all the time. And I might even be wrong about like my analysis of this situation. And is it okay? Is it okay if I just like throw something at you, rant a little bit? Is that going to be okay? And that's the next point. Ask them if it's okay, if you can go on a rant for a little bit. So you're saying, look, I'm not perfect and I don't claim to be perfect. I also do bad shit. Because if they come back to you later and you're like, well, you're bad too. You're like, yeah, no, I know. I, I did say that. And I meant it when I said it. They're going to be like, all right, fuck, I can't do that. Time for me to fess up that I'm also not doing great here, right? In addition, you have to at least know in your head and have to at least admit if they ask and potentially even say up front before they ask, like, I, I could be wrong about this whole thing. Because you could be like, hey, I didn't really like that you took time away from the party to go talk to Kevin for an hour. And I know that we've only been dating for like three weeks, but I really like you. And I know you've been with Kevin a long time. And I'm just like, I just don't know what to think. I'm not jealous type. I just kind of want to know. And she could be like, oh yeah, now he's telling him to go fuck himself. And he's never speaking to me again. It took me an hour to get him to understand that. I'm going to call the police if I ever see him. And I really like you. And you're like, oh, sorry. I totally misconstrued that. Like I said, I might have. Remember, you don't have a 100% probability of knowing that you understand the situation that you're entering with that conversation or that you're in the right about the situation. So you can just upfront admit that. And it's nice for the other person to hear because you're taking yourself off the God complex step stool and you're saying, look, even what I'm about to say, like it just may not be true. And a lot of people on the margins will be more likely to be more open to what you're saying. Ask them if you can go on a rant for a bit. I like to do this. Again, none of these are mandatory. They're just helpful. It is nice when you get their okay to hit it. And you can say this in a billion different ways. But it's less nice if you're like, hey, let me spit at you real quick. Watch this. And you can just go. Because they'd, like, they'd be like, hey, can, can we do this tomorrow? Can we just, I'm, I got a super important job interview later today. Can we not? <laughs> They might not be in a good headspace and be like, I'm really tired. I'm really hungry. I love what you have to say and I want to hear about it. Let me just eat and rest for a sec. Like two hours, I'll be right with you. Some shit like that. Also, asking them if it's cool demonstrates humility on your part, which is nice. It gets people more likely to listen to you. And also, it's just a very nice thing to do. You are not entitled to ever, ever speak to anyone about anything. Communication is always and everywhere a two-way street. And a nice person, it's generally for important conversations, which have some meat behind them, it's good to ask. And listen, if they're not into it, hey, like, there's your sign. You know, like, if you've talked to your girlfriend three times and you're like, is it okay if we chat about this? And she's like, actually, nah, I'm good. You're like, time number three, you're like, hey, I packed up all my shit already, so see, never. Because, like, yeah, you can tell. When you get to getting the point, after they say cool, you get to the point. You want to be brief and to the point. You don't want to weave around for too long because you've already maybe done some weaving of like, is it okay if I ask you and I'm all, I'm also really bad at this? Fine, get to it. So be cogent, but the gentle version of the point. Try to drive the point home in a way that's going to be taken as the least curt possible, possible. Some shit, you got to say, there's, the shit itself is real. You'd be like, I know you're sleeping with Sandy still. There's not a whole lot of ways to say that, but you can say it softer rather than harder. Because if you give people a harsh truth, there's a higher probability that they'll just, and they just won't get anywhere. 
that if you give people even the harsh truth, but phrased in a gentler way, there's a higher probability, no guarantees in any of this, that they're going to be a little bit more open to hearing what you have to say and thinking about it. And I prefer oftentimes, not always, an open-faced compliment sandwich. The regular compliment sandwich is, is a closed sandwich, two breads. So you go, hey, I really love what you wore last night, but I think you dressed like a fucking whore. But honestly, the dress color and fabric was amazing. That's the sandwich. So they're the middle part that you really wanted to say in the other two parts. I think it's often overkill. It also seems like when you put the top face on, like after you say the real thing you wanted to say, which is obvious, it should be unless you're doing that other fallacy we talked about where you just, the breads are too thick. should be obvious when you're saying what it is you're saying. If you come too hard afterwards with too much of like, but everything's cool and you're totally great and you're wonderful, it just sounds insincere at that point. So a nice sincere thing of couching what you're going to say in a positive light or admitting that like person has other good qualities, this isn't the end of the world, tons of different stuff to say and approach here. Then you hit him with the truth then you hit him with the next thing. That might be a little bit more genuine because what you're doing is this. I could actually just graph it out with my hands. A person's mood state is right here. And if they dip below a certain level, they get recalcitrant and annoyed and pissed and you get no traction. So if you give them a compliment sandwich first, the first piece of bread, it takes them up to here. You said, hey, I don't like the way you've been cooking lately. They fall to here, but that here is still north of that mood state that makes them degenerate. So they're like, hey, dude, I love your cooking. And they're like, great. But last night, what you made was not your best work. Versus, because they'd be like, oh my God, my cooking's great. Oh, yeah, everyone screws up, but I'm a great cook. You just said I was. So everyone screws up. Every now and again, you're like, great, awesome. If you never make that thing again, it'll be great. And they're like, great, okay, sweet. That was a disaster. But if you just start out with the shit, of like, last night what you made was atrocious, they don't know that you think they're a great cook. And they might have be having a bad day. And they might be having a crisis of confidence in some other thing that relates to everything else in their life. And all of a sudden they're like, okay, I guess I just won't cook anymore. And you're like, no, 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 no. But that, 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 there's no time machine. You should have said that shit first. You don't have to do this. But when you need the big guns, well, nice little compliment sandwich, open face, Tell them something nice, something true. You never, ever lie about that kind of stuff. And then you tell them that real, real. But that real, real should be couched in a gentle way if you want the highest probability of success, of course. Point number eight in the sequence. Again, optional like all of these, but suggested depending on the degree of the severity of the problem. When you're done, you essentially try to communicate to them that you meant what you said in the best way possible. Not to be a dick, not to put some crazy heavy shit on them for no good reason, but because you care. You care about them, you care about their well-being, and you care about your relationship with them. My wife and I have a thing we say to each other when we're in a uh, disagreement, right? Before she gets the, she's a Filipina, so she knows the knife fighting martial art at genetically. She just knows how to do it. She's stabby. So she gets the knife out and we have a thing we say, say same team, same team. We're on the same team, the marriage team, and there's two of us, and we have the same, we have total unification of values that we talk about, and thus we're partners in life heading the same way. So when we say same team, we already know what that means. I don't just say that to someone randomly. They're like, what team, motherfucker? You just told me I was ugly. When we say same team, it is to recommunicate the attitude, the reminder that Everything I do for you and say to you and say about you is with the eventual goal that it makes our team better. And you're on that team. We want to get better together. It's all about togetherness. There is no misalignment. That can really help. Sometimes it's required. Sometimes it's a big help. Sometimes it's overkill or it's inappropriate to be like, oh, same team. They're like, shut up. <laughs> I just should have just shut the fuck up. But Many times, it's a really good thing to kind of drive home and be like, all that shit I just said, I just want you to know. I meant it like, because I care. And I want to know. I just want you to know that. Number nine, next point. Reaffirm that you really give a shit about them and how they feel. 
potentially reaffirm that you didn't have to have this conversation with them. You could have just ghosted them and just never talked to them about it or never talked to them at all, whatever you have. Again, that point, it's optional, but it is a tool in the arsenal you may want to need because some people are softer than others. Some people are hard as fuck. You could just more or less give the shit to them straight and you could do like two of these nine points so far. Some people are softer than others. Like when you're talking to grandma, you use all nine points. And some people are less patient. So you don't want to talk too much to them. And they're like, yeah, just get to the point. Let me respond. Some people are more patient. And a lot of times the same people that are pretty soft are also pretty patient. They'll let you have their peace because they don't even want to talk. They're so fucking scared and so intimidated. So especially if you are, let's say, somebody's boss and they're your employee and they're a little sheepish person, you may definitely want to do 0.8, 0.9, all the shit. Reaffirm what they say. When you're done, you say you meant the best way possible. It seems like overkill. Like I'm talking to you guys right now. A bunch of you listening are probably like, Jesus Christ, man. What are we like solving world peace here? Holy shit. Just tell them they did the dishes wrong. Yeah. Some people can hack it. And there's minimal amount of this stuff that you need. What I'm giving you is a toolkit, an arsenal that when the person is someone who's really, really like real soft and can't take criticism really well, you really care about them, you might want to layer in as much of this as possible. And they have the bandwidth for this. Point number 10, next in the sequence, cut yourself off because you can ramble. I can sure shit ramble as evidenced by this video. And ask them what they think. Be like, okay, what do you think about that? It's so important to do this in most cases. Because remember, you're not just giving a Trieste. You're not just like, hey, like, uh, here's my opinion. Anyway, see you later. Like, that's, that's, that's insane. A communication's a two-way street. Now you want to know what they have to say about it, what they think about it. In most cases, that is a very good idea. Point 11. Remember, there's 12 points. Actually listen to what they say. Because it's so easy to just cut your piece and fuck off. So easy to cut them your piece and just they talk back and you're like, wah, 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 wah. Scott, what's that one show with the Snoopy and uh, Peanuts? That the adults talk like nonsense or whatever? It's really trippy because like, ostensibly the children can understand them. Yes, I understand that the animals don't. But how come the children don't understand the adults? Or do they? <laughs> I know you're waiting for your response. Oh, yeah. Uh, I've never watched it either, but for a few things here and there. And to be honest, folks, before you get pissed, I'm kidding. Uh, it's a dog shit show. I don't know what it's about. I don't like that stupid bird. I don't like the dog. I don't like Linus. What kind of name is that? Anyway, listen to what they think because you are communicating. And the last point is a bit of a trick here. Point 12 is once they give you the feedback to what you said, you are officially in the world of arguing to convince. And that is when you use the gentlest version of arguing to convince possible. To review, this is from video number five. You can search for this video profoundly easily. <laughs> Mike is told making progress video number five. It'll come right up. Couple of steps here in arguing to convince. Learn the other perspective. Hey, guess what? That's point 11. That's actually listening to what they say. The last point, you're learning the other perspective. You invite them to address questions you have about their perspective. You try to recapitulate their answers to the questions and try to work towards an intermediate perspective where you can both agree. And then at some point, either when you fix the problem or when you realize the problem isn't going to be fixed right then and there, you politely egress from the conversation, thank them, et cetera. So you can go back to that video and get a, a retool. But yes, arguing to convince comes in really handy, exactly in these kinds of situations. But notice how much stuff in important relationships for big issues, we had to do 11 things until we got to arguing to convince. Didn't have to. 11 tools you have before you get even to the nice way of talking to people. Those are your steps. Those are your steps. Will this work? Maybe. And here's how it might work. Sometimes you talk to someone, they get right on board, crush it out, fist bump, you're good, issue done. It'll happen a lot. Sometimes it's a long conversation. So after 35 minutes or an hour and 40 minutes, you hug, you cry, you crush it out, you're done. 
Sometimes it's a few conversations. And there's some weirdness in between those conversations because you started a nasty convo, but then Lucy came over because she was supposed to come over for drinks and you're sitting there and your wife's sitting there and Lucy's like, so what are you guys up to? And you're like, just another day of fun. And your wife's like, yep, it's been really fun. You just hammered it out for two hours and got nowhere. And Lucy's like, great, threesome. And you're like, yeah, all right, Lucy, let's just get it going. That's why you're here. My advice to you and so far as I'm even capable of giving advice on this, because I suck at this myself, is be as civil as possible in the interim. It's okay to not be lovey-dovey with your significant other while the shit is in the air, but at least be civil. Don't be passive aggressive. Don't be rude. Don't storm off. Just be like, hey, I'm, I'm going to go to the store, by the way. Do you need anything? You don't have to be like, hey, honey, I'm going to the store. Like, but, oh, hold on. Don't come at me like that. We didn't, we didn't fucking finalize anything, motherfucker. Straight up, still try to be helpful, give the person some space, and they you, but be civil because remember, you're on the same team. And uh, you don't want a history of breaks in civility. Not because anyone's watching, but because you like that person and civility is the least you can do for somebody you like. Sometimes it's an issue that doesn't get resolved for a long time and you have to be prepared for that. Weeks, months, years. And... Sometimes it's an issue that never gets resolved. So you have to be prepared for that. And in between the issue getting resolved in a long time or the issue getting resolved never, there is a middle potential where you might have to bend your preferences and understanding towards an intermediate position. Because sometimes you're like, okay, I'm not going to get the person to behave this way like I would ideally like. But what is it that I'm willing to compromise on? And compromise, the biggest fact in compromise is you're still cool with it. People think compromise is like, well, I hate this person for doing this, but I'm just going to have to swallow it. Uh-uh, that's not compromise. That's exit. You're still okay with it at the end of the day. That's compromise. That's a good compromise. That might not be in the cards. So you might even try to compromise. That doesn't work. Then either you have some more convos or you think of an exit strategy because you don't want to be in that relationship or at least in that way anymore. And that's totally okay. There, In any given relationship, there's a lot you can do to smooth things over and make them good. But there are also situations and relationships where nah, all the smoothing in the world doesn't do anything and you just can't be in that relationship anymore. And then you're not. And that's okay because life goes on and you'll have many great relationships, et cetera. The biggest insight here on this time course thing is do not rush the process and do not assume you know how long it will take. You'd be like, well, we got to go out with friends in half an hour. Might as well talk to my wife about our in, in, impending childlessness because I just got tested and my sperm don't work. Holy shit. <laughs> don't think it'll just take 30 minutes. Maybe you'll be pleasantly surprised that it takes three. She's like, yeah, actually, the doctor told me my ovaries are dead. So fuck it. Let's go get drunk. You're like, oh, whoa. <laughs> but it could not go well that way. Don't think you'll know how long it's going to take or even if it will succeed at all. I don't want to be overconfident. So you come to every major disagreement, every major issue, every major discussion, conversation with a significant other or someone you care about as a sort of like, well, here's where we are, let's talk without like, hey, can we can we wrap this up in 20 minutes? Like, wow, it must be real important for you. And a lot of times there's this bias to be like, like hey, hey, we got to get this resolved. Like, do we? We could just go our separate ways. Remember, there's always an option in almost every relationship. You could just go your separate ways, maybe really technically in every relationship. Even if you're on a deserted island building a boat to get off there, they can be like, you know what? Fuck you. I'm going on the other end of the island. You're like, but we're both going to die. They're like, yeah, great. Oh, man, I guess they could have always walked away. So just treat conversations not in a rushed manner and not in a manner full of hubris where you think like, oh, we'll for sure be able to crash this out. Have some a little bit of respect, a bit of reverence for the process. Be open-minded and ready to do the thing and don't attach yourself too much on outcome or how long the thing is going to take. And that's just some shit like there's no category other, other than wisdom for that kind of insight. And I'm not a very wise person. Sometimes I get a few gems um, because I didn't know that when I was younger and already as smart as I was, uh, for whatever that counts. I just, it's pure, raw, painful experience 
that if you think you're going to be able to crush everything out quick and it doesn't happen, you're like, oh yeah, okay. It's not up to me because it's up to the other person too. That's the big one. Lastly, the incremental approach to getting better at conversations. Try to do this, all the stuff I suggested and whatever else you think is good as much as you can in this realm. Try to do your best. Try to follow as many of the tips as I gave that you need in this uh, in a certain situation and try to avoid the no-go areas like being sarcastic and mean and all this other stuff. You will not be perfect and that's okay. After years of practice on these principles myself, I still suck a shitload of times. I'll be on Instagram and tell someone, I'm like, you suck. And I hit sand and I'm like, what am I even doing? We all just have a goal we can have together, which is to try to get a little bit better over time. You don't have to be perfect, but you can do a little better over time. And as you have a conversation and after you have it, if you didn't do so well and you know you didn't do so well because you didn't do some of these things that you did some of the stuff you know you were supposed to do and you didn't do some of the stuff you knew you probably should, reflect on that and be like, okay, 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 okay. I know exactly what I did wrong here. I got sarcastic. And I know that next time I'm going to try not to get sarcastic. The thing that saves me the most is picking my battles. And that's the last thing I want to tell you guys. If I'm not in an emotional and logical place, I neither feel like opening up to a good conversation, nor do I have my ducks in a row of what I'm going to say and why I think I'm correct. I just shut the fuck up for longer. So I either come correct or I shut up. Now, I don't always do that either. But on my best days, if I'm not ready to chat about something because I haven't quite coalesced what I'm going to say and I'm emotionally kind of still pissed and I don't want to really have the conversation, I just don't start some shit. So your best tool at the end of the day in all difficult conversations is getting your ducks in a row and getting to a place of kind of emotional equanimity, like your your wusa, your chill. As chill as you can be in any case. And then you have the talk. Don't rush into this stuff. Don't pop off at the mouth. If you really feel like having a talk with someone, that's probably the very wrongest time you could be doing it. And I know that's counterintuitive, but our intuition really doesn't serve us well in arguing to convince, which is why most people suck total dick at it. Anyway, let's get in the comments and yell at each other. See you guys next time.